Welcome to Speakernomics, the official podcast of the National Speakers Association, brought to you by Leadership Books. I am Kenneth Kinney, but friends call me Shark. And like you, I'm a professional speaker, and I love listening to Speakernomics. Speakernomics is the professional speaker show that will help you thrive and grow your speaking business so you too can change the world one keynote session, workshop, and speech at a time. And on today's episode, we're going to speak with Fotini Akonomopoulos. She's a speaker, author, and a negotiation consultant, nicknamed the negotiator as a child, and now empowering Fortune 500 executives and their teams across the globe to achieve their objectives and guiding them through high-stakes scenarios. Fotini, I hope that you're ready to negotiate with me a little bit today, but welcome to Speakernomics. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Perfect. Now, to all my speaking friends, how do you go about negotiating what you want to close the deal? If you're not getting what you want out of your speaking life, then it's time to take control of that conversation. Let's face it, a lot of speakers find negotiating difficult and even intimidating, but it's a skill that can dramatically help you when you master it and last you a lifetime. And it's often just to get a little bit more. And before we jump in, make sure to go to speakernomics.com. That's where you can find the tips, insights, and knowledge to help you become a better speaker, build a better business, and get paid to speak. Now, Fotini, I know why I got my nickname Shark years ago, but I want to know, how does someone get the nickname The Negotiator as a child? Well, I grew up, I'm going to date myself now, but if you've ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, that was my upbringing. And so I had to negotiate my way out of the house. And so I was I was constantly bucking the trends. And it got to the point where even as a six year old, my dad was like, we don't need to hear from you, negotiator. I was a little more assertive than most of the kids in my family. Um, My sister, my cousins would all say, get get Fotini to ask for it. Maybe I was the youngest and I was the cute one or whatever it was. (laughs) But I was the one that was unafraid to ask for things. So even to this day, my dad recently said the same things like we don't need to hear from you, negotiator. We didn't ask you to get involved in this one. Um, So it just kind of stuck. It was one of those things where I didn't want to be bound by the norms of my, you know, upbringing, my community. And so I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing boundaries. So I'm curious over your career, how does someone become a negotiation expert? Uh, Accidentally is the easy answer. (laughs) So I ended up doing an MBA in organization behavior just because I found it really interesting. um, And I did that straight out of my undergrad. And then I was recruited by L'Oreal. So I was working for years, basically negotiating with Walmart on a daily basis. And they're some of the toughest negotiators in the world. And I really enjoyed it. Like I got a thrill out of having those sales meetings with them, you know, changing the world one lipstick at a time. And then I was recruited by another company briefly, uh, Smuckers, the food company. And then when I was in, when I was interviewing the leaving L'Oreal, I kept asking people, all, all the folks I was interviewing with, what are you doing to invest in your employees? And Smuckers won me over when they said, we're going to do this really expensive negotiation training this summer. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's a skill I want to keep working on. And it ended up that two months into my tenure there, the company that hired a, that we hired to teach us to be better negotiators ended up poaching me. They said, you should really be doing what we do. And I was like, yeah, sure. Someday when I've got more experience, because I hadn't even turned 30 yet. And they said, no, seriously, you should be doing what we do. And so it took them a year to convince me to come on board. But when they did, I started working for this British company, traveling all over the world, running workshops and training everybody from the CEO of oil and gas, billion dollar companies to the junior account managers at Nestle and other companies like that. And then when it was those clients who went, it's great that you trained our team, but we have a hundred million on the line. We have a billion on the line. What do we do? What do we say? I started sitting in the boardrooms with them and plotting out their negotiation strategies and coaching them through some of their really intense conversations and negotiations. And I love that too. Um, So it just kind of became part and parcel of what I enjoyed doing every day. It got me leaping out of bed every single morning. And I started digging into the research and the background and, and the case studies that I had accumulated over the years and just kept building on that. And now that only 32 years old, look how far you've come. <laughs> it's all those L'Oreal products. That's why, yeah, that's exactly. why you think I look so young. <laughs> well, then let's talk a little bit about negotiation for speakers. With what you've learned as a negotiation expert, how did you go about employing that in your own speaking career to help you grow? And then what are some of the tactics that you think could help other speakers in that process? So one of the kind of the biggest principles, I guess you can say, of negotiation that I employ in the speaking world is about value. So 
there's, you can think of negotiation as this competitive, whatever you take, I lose and whatever I take, you lose. If it's just about dollars, or you can think of it as, Hey, we can do this cliche, grow the pie thing. How much more value can we grow together? And then at some point we'll have to divide up the pie, but at least we get more and more pie altogether. And so if I think about that pie example, it's a much more collaborative and a more comfortable place for a lot of folks. And that's where I like to live because I think there's ways to unlimited grow the pie. Um, when I started thinking about it, it really kind of clicked when I, I started, I ended up working for myself uh, about nine years ago by accident. It was, I quit a job that wasn't serving me anymore. And clients went, Hey, when are you going to come back and work with us? And I was like, I don't work for that company anymore. They said, we didn't hire the company. We hired Fotini. We want to keep working with you. And I kept saying yes to opportunities. And I kept having to come up with pricing and I just kept going, okay, I, they said yes to that really easily. So let me, <laughs> let me increase it the next time they ask, let me increase it the next time they ask and so on. And then when a client said to me, how would you like to make more money? I was like, tell me more. He said, well, this team has millions of dollars pouring through their fingers. And we, if we can increase the profitability by just half a percent, I will pay you 15% more than your fees. I said, let's talk about that. And we started having really curious conversations about how would we measure it and what would profitability mean for them and what could I do to ensure that? And we just started opening up this conversation about how we could grow the pie together. And that was an eye-opening one. So we ended up negotiating a really great deal for the both of us because I also insured him. I'm like, I know what I do is is good and I know it provides value. So if you're not hitting those numbers, I'll come back and make it right. I'll correct it. So we had a lot of trust between us as well. And so when I think about the speaking world and how I've started to implement that same mentality around value, I get a lot of requests from nonprofits and from women's groups and things like that who are the least budgeted in the world. Um, you know, Women's Day is a very busy week for me, but it's always a, you know, I have to think about this very carefully about where I dispense my energy because they don't have, they don't always have the budgets for women's events. And so I'll go out there and I'll tell them, look, here's the fees that I command. If you can find ways to help me find those fees somewhere else, if you can find help, find ways to help me grow my business in other ways, I'm open to a conversation. But I start it with telling them what my fees are up front. Because one of the principles is if you want to be, you mentioned the word in the introduction, control, right? If you want to have control, you don't let them lead you wherever they want to go. I don't want them to tell me what their budget is because I don't want to hear it. I don't want them to anchor this number on the subconscious brain that they think that's going to be acceptable to me or that I now have to work towards. I want them to working towards my number. And maybe it's in dollars, maybe it's in value, maybe it's in opportunities and referrals and all sorts of other stuff because my business has grown leaps and bounds by word of mouth. I have never done any marketing. So if, if that works for me in terms of that value, then I'm doing something right because it's bringing more dollars into my pocket. Well, and I think in the spirit of Cavett Robert, the founder of NSA, he again said, it's not about how we divide up the pie. There was enough for everybody. Let's just build a bigger pie. So that, that could have been a more apropos quote, but it was something I noticed as a speaker when I ran my own event. I actually was reaching out to some speakers that I knew who we were talking about how much I could potentially pay them for the event. I was surprised at how many of them didn't think about some of the things they could ask for that I was throwing out there, like a camera like really good videography yeah. for the event, still shots, all those kinds of things, you know, referrals, things like that. It's it's often that I find that even seasoned speakers don't always think about that the same way that you're talking about right now. So when somebody gets on the phone or in an email or what whatever exchange with somebody, how do you typically go about handling that conversation to where you start asking people, the main conversation is about the range of pay for the event. So I don't want to shock them with that out of the gate. I want to make sure they're bought in before I, I give them that price. And usually when people call me and I think the same as for other speakers, there's a lead for a reason. They're interested in you for a reason, but I just want to make sure I secure that. So I'll ask them about their objectives. You know, what do you want to accomplish from this? Why did you ask for me? Why did you find me? And so on. And it's like, great. Now that I can spit some of that back out at them and go, okay, here's the things that I do that help meet those objectives. They're like nodding their heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. This is the time when they're the most hungry, when they're the most bought in to hit them with your price. Because if you hit them with your price early, and then they go, oh, that's a lot of money. Well, now if I feel like I have to try and convince them, I feel like I'm digging myself a hole. I look really desperate and eager. But if I've told them all of the reasons why I fit what their need and what they need and what their objectives are and all of those things, and then I hit them with the price, they can still tell me I'm expensive. And I'll say, okay, well, what about that? You know, what about your objectives? Is that still something you want to do? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the price for that. 
So tell me how close you can get to that. Tell me what is keeping you from being able to achieve that price point, that ROI, whatever it is. I'm going to be curious about my price, but I don't need to justify my price because I already sold them. I gave them all the justification before I hit them with them. It's building up to that as opposed to hitting them with it and then trying to dig yourself out of a hole uh, in that moment. So the order in which you do things is incredibly important. So get that buy-in right before you hit them with the price. Too often I find people make the opposite mistake. And there's just this element of the order of which we say things that makes us look eager or desperate versus credible and worthy of what it is that we're putting out there. And if they have a an objection to the price, then we can talk about it some more and go, tell me what some of those objections are. How can we find ways to work around those objections? Now it's a problem solving conversation instead of a justifying and convincing conversation because the convincing is done. They're bought in. They want you. It's just a matter of figuring out what are the mechanics and the logistics of making that budget work. So another question that, that I have is how do you go about negotiating with someone who granted if they are looking to pay you 10 pineapples but your fee is 30 then it may be too great a divide but if you start talking about ranges to get them what are your best tactics if you will about bridging that gap in between so Again, it starts with taking control of the conversation and making sure they know what your value is, what your worth is before you have a chance to, before they have a chance to anchor you something else. It's the concept and behavioral science of anchoring, right? First impressions are lasting impressions. If you think of an anchor on a boat, I know you know all about boats. So if you think of a, a boat, you drop that anchor, the whole purpose of it is so you don't drift far away from that general area. You might move around a little bit, but you're not going to end up drifting off to sea. And so when it comes to that first offer, that first number that comes on the table, we're we're dropping an anchor. I don't want them to drop me an anchor in this budget area that is way too low for me because it feels like it's so much effort to drag that anchor back into my space. So I'm going to make sure that they know here's the, the anchor area that I play in. How can you get close to that? If they go, whoa, we don't have anywhere near that. This is our budget. And then I say, okay, well, let's talk about how we can close that gap together. Here are the things. I just went through this exercise, in fact, with a training client the other day. Um, they saw me on stage somewhere. It was actually a vendor, a sponsor in the room who went, hey, you work with investment advisors and stuff like that. We work with them too. Do you still do training? I heard you mention it on stage. And so I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's have a conversation. So they called me up. They were a small company, unlike the big company that I, association that I was working with. And they said, and I mentioned my, after we got them all bought in and here's the process and here's how I handle things. Does that sound? like it's meeting your needs absolutely it does that's exactly what we need wonderful the price of it is this and they went wow that's more than our revenues in the month of january and i said okay well it sounds like this is something you really need so tell me what you're working with and they said i don't want to insult you by even putting a number out there i said how would this help let me tell you what's important to me and the ways that i can find value from working with you things that are valuable to me are getting on stages. You saw me on a stage. I sure I imagine you go to a lot of conferences, you know, if there's referrals and ways to get me onto other stages and so on, that's something that's super important to me. Here's other things that are important to me. Here's other ways that I grow my business and selling books and all of these things and so on. They went, Oh, Oh, we have something for you. We have a database of all of these conferences and blah, blah, blah. And we know all these people that we can introduce you to. I said, great. If you can help me make money and close that gap, I don't need to make that money off of you. So let's find way. And we came up with a really cool, creative, complex proposal where I delivered their workshop and I ended up taking out some bits of the workshop that impeded on my time. We ended up doing stuff at the last minute. So I wasn't selling out time that I could sell to somebody else later at full price. We found some really creative ways that were super valuable to me and ridiculously valuable to them, where both of us are really happy about it. And we're going to have an ongoing relationship. And I know for a fact, I'm going to get way more referrals out of them just by having that creative approach. So there was an easy way to justify giving them a lower fee when they found other ways to make me money. The same thing happened to me last week when I was in Calgary for an event. And I said to the women who were running this Women's Day event, I said, you know, I know you can't afford me because here's my price and I know you're a small event and all of that kind of stuff. But what else can you do? How many sponsors do you have coming on board? Can I help you pitch some of those sponsors? Or if, you know, we they said, we have some sponsors that were on the fence and they said, not this year, next year. I said, well, what if you called them and you said, hey, Fotini's going to be in town. I know you really liked her from the pitch. She'd be willing to do something for you at a discount because she's already in town. Now, all of a sudden I'm making, I'm closing that value gap 
by getting in front of more audiences and more audiences are great for me because gigs get you more gigs and it's no more time out of my calendar because I'm there anyway. I can squeeze in two gigs in a day. So all of a sudden now we're creating these value opportunities by just opening up the conversation and getting really creative about where are those potential other sources of revenue and value. But you don't do that if you're just fixed on I must get my fee from these guys in this format. You got to get creative with it. And I want to applaud you for using a concept that I use all the time on stage, anchoring. It's one of my favorite behavioral science tactics. You know, one of the things that I think so many speakers did during COVID is they started pulling their fees back. Mm -hmm. And then now that things have gotten good again, I've run into the same thing where I increase my fee. I'm sure you have as you've gotten busier. As, as anybody gets busier, we all know a lot of people that are doing extremely well in this sport and they are raising their fees. Have you really run into the conversations to where you have to negotiate a little bit about my fee was, you know, X number of mangoes last year, but now that the market's hotter, I'm in more demand. You're in more demand for X plus five more mangoes. How do yeah. you sort of deal with, with increasing those fees when people know you from a previous fee and you're trying to negotiate to where you are today, as opposed to where you were last year or what, whatever other point in time? Well, one of the things is just being unapologetic about it. You know, the fact is I'm I'm in higher demand and therefore the fees are higher. So this is the reality that we're facing. So I have had that scenario even pre-pandemic where I, I've been in the speaking world now for a number of years, but not really doing it seriously or full time. So I had folks who reached out to me a million years ago when my fees were way lower, probably a third or less of what they are today. And they went, we loved you. We'd love to have you back. And I said, I'd love to be back. Here's where my fees are today. And they go, oh, that's way more expensive than we thought. I said, I totally understand that. And a lot has changed between now and then. So let's talk about ways we can grow value. And if that's not an option, then I'm happy to refer you to somebody else in the family who I know will serve you really well. I'm not afraid to say no to stuff, but I'm also not afraid to say yes to stuff. If it's an easy gig, if it's something that fits in my calendar really nicely, if I know I'm not going to be able to sell that time to someone else. One of the questions I ask people all the time is, help me to help you. Help me to find a way to make it easy to not say no to you. Can you do this on a Monday or a Friday when no one else is booking me? Can you do this virtually versus an in-person where I can know I can squeeze in more stuff? And it's just going, what else can we do to make this an easy yes? And they're coming up with now creative solutions for it as well. Like I've had, you know, ERG groups, so special interest groups reach out to me before and go, we want to have you in. We have a, we have a ridiculous, like missing a couple zeros budget <laughs> for you. And I was like, I can't give you the same show. I give people who have those extra zeros. Well, what can we do that's more interesting? interesting. Maybe we can do a podcast conversation instead of a keynote. So that way I'm not, I'm not um, devaluing my brand of what I bring to the stage, but I'm still giving them value more than what they can afford to pay for. But it also gets me in front of an audience. It gets me, you know, in front of an audience who are all going to jump on Amazon and buy the book as soon as they, you know, they hear what I have to say. So there's, it's about looking for those opportunities of value, not seeing it as just discounting for the sake of discounting. I don't like that, but it's changing the dynamic. It's changing the circumstances. If you want me on a Wednesday midweek flying somewhere and so on, of course, you're going to have to pay my full fees. If, especially if you're booking me six months to a year out, I've had to say no to people who try to book me two years out. I'm like, there's no way my fee is going to be the same two years out. So I've said no to those gigs. And I said, call me again, you know, next year when you're, when we're a little closer to that date. Um, but there's different circumstances when it's on a Monday or a Friday, when it's, you know, on a time where I'm not going to be selling that time to someone else, when it's short term, really quick turnaround versus booking six months out. Those are the types of things I look for to go, we can change the, the dynamics. And that means it allows me to change the fee in a way that's not going to feel bad to me and may still make you feel really good about the value that you're getting. It's a very empowering feeling too. I remember in the past, someone that had hired me in the olden days and where I would have gone for like two cheeseburgers and a bus pass. <laughs> and it was many, many thousands of, of mangoes later. I felt good, not arrogant about it, but I just felt good about being able to tell them, no, you know, we, can, we can get to somewhere. But I think when speakers get to that place, you'll, a light bulb will go off and you'll feel much better about it. Yeah. Well, then I have a question that I want to ask you from a previous guest. This is an interesting question too, because I think we've all had a few. What was your most deflating moment you've ever had on stage? Uh, okay. This one comes to mind really quickly. It was my very first gig post pandemic. So my first live event after being virtual for quite some time, apparently I was really arrogant about how well prepared I was for it. <laughs> and so 
I, you know, I'm in this little studio with lots of monitors and a big screen. And I had lots of crutches during the pandemic to be able to, I could practically read off the screen and you wouldn't know it. And I just had all of these things there. So I thought that I had my speech more or less memorized and I didn't. And during the pandemic, by the way, I actually stopped using slides because I didn't want to be a tiny box in the corner. And I'm not a tech person to manage all of the fancy things that a lot of people do. So I started going slideless. So I built slides for this event, like going back to what I did pre-pandemic. And I thought, okay, I've got the crutches there. The slides will be there to help me. And it was my first time doing 60 minutes instead of 45 minutes. Because during the pandemic, everybody virtually wanted shorter and shorter stuff. I was like, 60 minutes, that's no problem. In the past, I had a hard time cutting it down to 60 minutes. I want to give them everything but the kitchen sink. So I get up there and I realize I'm going through really quickly because I've forgotten chunks of I've forgotten entire stories. I didn't have it as well as well memorized as I thought I did. Yeah. And it was okay. It wasn't like it was a terrible gig. I didn't completely bomb. They got some value out of it. But what made it the worst feeling in the world for me was our friend Phil Jones was in the back of the room. I was the opening speaker and he was the closing speaker. And when you're in front of a speaker, you want to do your best. You want to get that feedback. You want to maximize the opportunity because you don't really often have the opportunity to get feedback from the pros when you're in that room. So he basically saw my worst gig I had ever done. And afterwards, of course, he was kind enough to give me feedback and all that stuff. And I knew a lot of it because I, I admitted I knew my own mistakes while I was making them on stage. Um, but it was just one of those things where you really want to put your best foot forward in those scenarios. And I didn't feel like I did. And I had the humility to go, I really need to do a lot more preparation before the next one comes around. So I was, I was never that ill prepared ever again. Um, but that was, that was a real low point I'd say in my speaking career. So it's a fair to mention that you did not know exactly what to say. <laughs> I get, I get 10% of every sale from Phil's book on this show. So I have another question then. What is a question that you would like to ask a future guest on this show? So I just came from NSA Thrive and I thought it was really interesting to hear about all of the ways that people are negotiating and all the things that they're adding on and the value adds that they're doing in their propositions. And so I would love to know what is the most creative negotiation solution that folks have come up with? That's fantastic. All right, well, let's do a quick recap based on Fotini's super advice. Number one, negotiation is not just you win, I win. It's about adding more value. We all should know about building a bigger pie. It's the spirit of Cabot. Number two, solidify why they were interested in you. Don't hit them with price too early. Then you're busy convincing them. Answer their questions first. She talked about what is keeping you from hitting that. It's the order. It's at least a place where you can have the conversation. And number three, Got a challenge for you. Do some homework. Study the concept of anchoring. Don't try to drag the anchor back. Fotini, any closing thoughts before we negotiate our way out of here? I would just say, I mean, I talk to folks about salary negotiations all the time, my MBA students, and I would just tell, remind people the same thing I remind my students is know your power. Know you're there for a reason. They've come to you for a reason. So feel really good about those reasons and don't be afraid to remind them of them before you, you put your numbers out on the table. And I think that really does change the game in terms of how you show up and how people respond to you in the process. Amen to that. Well, friends, make sure to join us at speakernomics.com and let your voice be heard. Thank you to Leadership Books for sponsoring this episode. I am Kenneth Shark Kinney, your host of the National Speakers Association's podcast, Speakernomics. And this has been another fantastic episode of the show. To everyone listening at home, thank you for the privilege of your time. And remember, Speakernomics is the podcast where you'll learn to speak, get paid, repeat. Hey.